Ja, Ladies and Gentlemen, Mesdames et Messieurs, meine Damen, meine Herren, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you on this Wednesday afternoon, seven o'clock in the evening, to our <coughs> webinar about green hydrogen, the dawn of the hydrogen economy, recent developments and activities. On behalf of the <coughs> organization, organization, Satorical organizations, oh Jesus Christ, of the organizations organizing this webinar. And this is um, <clears throat> on one hand side, on the German side, Hamburg University of Technology. It's the VDI <clears throat> in Germany. Um, and on the Tunisian side, it's the Tunisian Green Hydrogen Society, as well as GIZ <clears throat> in Tunisia, as well as the University of Cartago. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome everybody to this evening and to this event. After last week, we discussed the questions about um, hydrogen economy today and tomorrow. There we had a presentation from DNV about the hydrogen outlook, as well as an update about cost-optimized hydrogen production by wind power and photovoltaics. Based on this <clears throat> introduction and um, opening event, today it's my great pleasure to introduce the <clears throat> latest developments in the field of hydrogen production. And here we will have two <clears throat> outstanding presentations, one about offshore hydrogen production from <clears throat> Anne de Nienhaus from the ERM Group in Germany, giving an update about the possibilities to provide hydrogen offshore which is at least for North Europe a great opportunity and a topic which is very much tackled at the moment and very much discussed. And then we will have a presentation from Jens Kotzieper from ELF Consulting Engineering Engineers. Sorry about that. It was not 100% exact, but he will explain this later on. And sorry for my intellectual insufficiencies. He will give us a presentation about the role of PV power for hydrogen production. So from that point of view, we will have um, both options on one hand side, provision of hydrogen from wind and from PV. This is what you can expect today. And this is our program for the day. And with this, let's start. And first of all, I would like to ask Anne de Nienhaus from the ERM Group here in Germany to give us an update about offshore hydrogen production in, <clears throat> in <clears throat> the north of um, in the North Sea, I guess. <clears throat> For Nina, the floor is yours, and we are very much interested in your presentation. So just go ahead. Okay, thank you, Martin. So I'm going to share my screen, and um, would be good if you could give me a quick feedback, please, if um, when you can see it. Yes, okay. everything under control. So the floor is yours. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much for the opportunity to present today on. Here I'm Dolphin. So what we'll be talking about, what I'll be talking about is um, green hydrogen production from floating offshore wind. And um, to start, just a couple of words. Um, let me try to move that forward about ERM. I'm, I'm going to keep that very short. So basically, we are a global pure play sustainability consultancy. Actually, having a history of 50 years. So we celebrated our 50 year anniversary two years ago. And um, we started very much with um, environmental management, as actually our name says. Um, at that time, air protection, water protection. And over the years, we expanded, we changed more to um, social, or we, we expanded to social impacts, to looking at safety. And um, recently, over the last decade, you can say, a very big shift, basically, from looking at this kind of cleaning up end of pipe things to really providing sustainable solutions. And um, the dolphin concept, which we're going to talk about today, is one example of, of these types of sustainable solutions that um, we think really help us moving forward, moving to a sustainable economy. And you can see um, as well that we, as ERM, we have recently obtained support from additional um, companies who joined the ERM group, who have quite a big reputation actually in the field of, of hydrogen and renewables. So Element Energy, e tech and RCG. And together we've come up with um, what, what we call the Dolphin concept and which um, I'm going to talk about in the, in the next couple of minutes. So to set the scene, if we look at global offshore wind resources, we can see on this map here, the resources for floating wind and also for traditional fixed bottom offshore. 
In blue, we have the traditional offshore um, resources, which are based on the water depth. So here we can install fixed bottom installations. The green areas show us the potential where the water depths are more than 60 meters, which are suitable for floating wind. And we see that actually there is a capacity of um, 12,000 gigawatts um, worldwide of floating wind, of um, the majority being um, in the Northern Hemisphere across North America, Europe, China, Japan, but also in the Southern Hemisphere, we see certain areas where we have this potential for, for using, um, for installing capacity offshore and um, specifically for installing floating wind um, installations. Zooming in on, on in, in Europe, um, here again a map that shows us the areas which are suitable for fixed bottom um, wind and for floating. And the green areas here, largely across Ireland and, and the UK, show us these are areas where it get the water gets deep fairly soon. And the, these areas would be exploitable with um, floating wind. We see in the in the northern European area or in the um, across the, the shore of France, Benelux, Germany, Denmark. This is probably more fixed bottom area, so we have rather shallow water conditions. And what's interesting, if we look at the Mediterranean, here we are in a situation where actually the water gets deeper quite quickly. So we have limited potential for fixed bottom use, but we have quite some potential for floating use. And this is interesting for the for the dolphin concept and for the for the approach that we'll be talking about in this meeting. On on the right side, we basically um, see this illustrated in a little graph, and this is now for for Germany, um, issued by the Fraunhofer Institute, where we can also see um, that over the two, last two decades, so basically between 2000 and 2018, we've moved both farther ashore and into deeper waters. So we are we are in the process of basically um, covering the, the near shore area, the shallow areas. And in the future, as we move forward with installing wind potential, we will be moving further ashore and we will be moving in deeper waters. And this is this is now where the, where the dolphin concept comes in. So basically, um, if we, I'm going to skip that, but if we look at the, um, at the idea of dolphin, Basically, what we want to show is that um, green hydrogen from offshore wind, floating wind can be generated at scale and it can be cost competitive. And it's also the objective to demonstrate the availability of all technological components to basically perform together in offshore environment. So if we remember, last week we heard from, from Lucas Sens about um, projections, about hydrogen growth projections. And um, the, the big message there was that currently the uptake um, is, is slow and we're not we're not seeing the the developments that we actually want to see so the objective of, of the dolphin concept very clearly develop a concept that can be used and that can be basically um, replicated at scale to make sure that we we get basically get our boots on the ground and we don't keep talking about you know we need to to install hydrogen but um, we are then slow in, in actually following up the dolphin development was was accelerated, so there was um, funding under the UK hydrogen supply competition and the energy innovation program. So that really sped up kind of the, the um, research and the activities that had been going on for some time. And just um, a quick look at the design philosophy principle. So what was the what was the objective here? It's actually the idea is to have a modular design approach. So simplifying interface requirements and actually allowing this kind of replication at scale. Also an autonomous system with remote operations possible from shore. Basically, as we go further afield, it gets more and more difficult. And also the risk of, of for operational personnel becomes much higher. So the idea is to really have a normally unmanned system which um, can be operated remotely limiting um, basically OPEX costs, but also increasing the safety of the of their all activities. And then um, we wanted to demonstrate, or we wanted to make sure that there's technology equipment with a sufficient level of reliability, availability, and low maintenance requirements. So um, the supply chain considerations are very important. We wanted to implement inherent des safety design principles, and then obviously following the regulatory requirements. 
and in the absence of regulatory requirements, the internationally recognized codes and standards. So that's what we started with. And if we have a look at the concept, so what does the concept actually look like? This is the overview of, of Dolphin. So we have a semi-submersible um, triangular floater here, floating platform that is, is moored. It's anchored to the seabed by mooring lines. The wind turbine is installed. And then we have a, a top side, basically a, a deck where we have the top side structures installed. So basically a local hydrogen production with all the ancillary components. Um, so water desalination and um, the electrolyzer as such, and then also all the electrical um, and ancillary components all installed on this floating platform on the turbine. So modular design, every turbine basically stands alone and allows the hydrogen production. And then the hydrogen is exported through a pipeline, um, either right away to shore or first to a manifold. So that's the that's the concept, that's the idea behind it here. And um, before we came up with the with the concept, so that there was a comparative analysis. So basically, the the, the challenge was to see what is the most econ economic um, solution and what is also the most technically viable solutions. And we compared three different setups. So we compared first of all the classical concept, if you want, where we have the offshore wind park, we have a, a centralized um, electrical platform, converter platform offshore. We then export the electricity through a um, cable to shore, and we have an onshore electrolyzer, which then basically feeds the, the hydrogen to the, to the grid. We analyzed the pros and cons, and we also did an econom economic analysis. And I think what's currently also commonly known, uh, let's say, information is that electricity um, transport to shore is getting increasingly difficult, um, first of all, because of permitting issues. Then as we move further afield, it, it gets um, the, the, the costs basically rise exponentially. And um, it's, it's also just more effort to, to, to um, install the cables because typically electrical cables compared to pipelines just use a wider, wider space. So we will have certain limitations. That's the big, um, the big disadvantage if you want. The pros, obviously, all of this is proven design. design. So we have um, offshore turbines, we have converter platforms, we have electrolyzers onshore. So basically, this is um, technology that has been tested and doesn't need a lot of, of validation. The second concept we looked at was um, the centralized hydrogen production offshore. So basically, again, the offshore floating wind park and then a central electrolyzer offshore. The electricity from the turbines is fed into that electrolyzer. The electrolyzer generates the, the hydrogen and then the hydrogen is exported through a pipeline to shore. Um, advantages compared to the, to the first setup, obviously, we have only one pipeline typically, so we don't have the um, more complex setup of, of um, transporting electricity. Also in terms of having to integrate electricity to the, to the public grid, we don't have the curtailment or grid congestion issues. So we basically produce energy in a storable form right away and can then basically um, export it or have, have, have it in that way reaching the shore. And then again, it goes to further distribution. Um, the disadvantage here, the acid risk of the central electrolyzer, we have kind of a very high energy density in a small area and um, we have it all centralized. So if we have any problems there, we basically risk losing the whole asset um, if, uh, if something happens. And also kind of um, offshore electrolyzers, if we have floating areas, this kind of response of the electrolyzer to, to motion needs validation. So we don't know how does the system behave in that environment, in a very harsh offshore environment with lots of motion. So this is something that has not been tested and that needs validation. So that, in a nutshell, the second option. The th third, the third option that we looked at was um, local hydrogen production. And this is basically the dolphin setup. So saying we have 
offshore wind turbines and we have the electrolyzers integrated directly into the turbine. And again, looking at the pros and cons, the pros basically similar to the to the central electro offshore electrolyzer, we have the hydrogen gas pipeline to shore, so we don't need to export electricity. Um, we have quite a lot of advantages related to modular design. So basically we can scale up in a, in a modular way. Whereas if we have a central electrolyzer unit installed, basically what happens is that the first installations, when the capacity is not fully used, are quite costly. And then at a certain point, we reach the capacity limit of the electrolyzer and there's no additional installation possible. And then basically we need to move to a second um, electrolyzer, central electrolyzer, and the whole story starts again with this initial um, setup not being so cost effective, then ultimately um, reaching its limitation. With this, with the Dolphin concept, basically because it's it's a completely standalone system, it, it would be possible to, re possible to replicate it. The cons, the, the disadvantages, obviously, I mean, the the design with this modular unit, if we compare it to the simple offshore turbine, it's it's more complex. We have everything installed on that one single unit. Again, we have lots of unknowns, so we need to validate the electrolyzer's response to this offshore motion. We have these harsh environments, um, sprays and so on, which we need to deal with. So it's a very novel concept and we need to gain operating experience. So that's the, that's the core challenges if you want for the for the concept but ultimately i mean also from the from the comparative analysis and um, this this is for qualitative purposes now what we can see if we look at um, specifically the onshore h2 production we see how that raises rises very strongly with distance from shore due to that increased effort for the electrical connection we see that all of the um, offshore um, electrolyzers basically don't have this response, so they are they are not um, going up in that in that kind of um, linear way, but they are becoming more effective as we move further afield, relatively speaking. And um, from the components that we looked at, actually the um, the dolphin concept was the, the the most effective, and that was why that solution was ultimately selected for further development. So. One, one important element to mention is that the whole development from the beginning has focused very much on supply chain considerations. So we did not want to, to do something um, that was the work of you know one company and, and sitting somewhere in, in closed rooms developing concepts and, and then ultimately coming up with something. But it was really about engaging supply chain, which is why we looked at um, putting together a strong team of players and um, this is not so much about the names. I mean, all of these are renowned companies and the, and the working together was very good. But I think the message here is really, it is about um, you know engaging the whole supply chain and trying to find solutions that really bring us forward you know, rather than making this something like a, like a race um, to, to, to some place that we know that one individual company cannot reach because ultimately we need to join all of our efforts to, to basically be able to manufacture this whole, um, this large amount of, of units that we need in the future to really make this step change into towards the hydrogen economy. So one of the key points here really to engage the supply chain and to, to make that a beneficial project for, for everybody. This is also why quite a lot of the information that we've used is, is publicly or that we've generated is publicly available. So you can read Dolphin reports on the net and also on the on the EM website that, that provide quite a lot of technical information actually. Um, just a quick quick um, summary of the design here. So we see here the, the floating substructure again and so we have the mooring here. Here we have the onboard freshwater generation and the hydrogen units and also the power system, standby power system. And um, then we're exporting the hydrogen through a pipeline. Don't want to spend too much time on this one. Also the process schematic. So um, ultimately in the design, we've come up with a PEM electrolyzer. Um, you see that we have a seawater lift system, then basically de desalination, and um, then to the hydrogen storage tank, trying to minimize hydrogen um, amounts stored for safety reasons as well. 
So really making sure that we that we manage the export export. The oxygen here you see um, vented. I, we had the discussion. I think last week we had it as well, and in earlier um, webinars, what to do with the oxygen. And actually, what we are looking into now is really to make use of the oxygen because it is a valuable resource as well. And so that will be some um, idea for the next step. So we are right now in the in the feed study for a 10 megawatt prototype, and all of these things will will be analyzed in more detail in this um, in this study. We have a fuel cell yourself for standby power, and then here you see the um, also see what a disposal um, tank basically and um, some treatment for the for the seawater as such. So that's the, the process schematic. Now, what, what is the plan moving forward? So right now, as I said, we are we're in the feed study for 10 megawatt units. So the plan is that we are installing um, one 10, 10 megawatt unit as a prototype, as a standalone unit. Before we do that, we planning to have trials, offshore trials in in the summer late summer of, of, of this year. And basically the idea here is to validate really the, um, the installation. So to validate the electrolyzer response to motion, also to simulate a power curve. So we're going to install a biofuel, um, a biodiesel generator to simulate an offshore wind turbine power curve. We're not going to use a turbine as such, but really simulating the curve to see um, how the electrolyzer responds to that. And we're also going to test the um, basically the the riser, so the connection of the hydrogen pipeline to the station, to make sure that this is actually suitable for and and um, that the the maximum uh, the minimum band radius is not is not um, basically um, or can be can be met. So a couple of couple of things that we're going to try in these offshore um, with this offshore system. And one once we've finished the trials and hopefully finished them successfully. The next step, as I said, would be the, the 10 megawatt demonstration project. So that is planned for 2025. Here we're looking to go off the coast of Aberdeen. So there are already floating wind turbines in Aberdeen and the dolphin would then basically add to that by being the first project that has the, the electrolyzer and the hydrogen production on the turbine. The plan is here to have a 15 kilometer pipeline to connect the turbine to Aberdeen. And Aberdeen has kind of a leading role in that the city is looking very much to the different uses of hydrogen. So looking at sector coupling, actually, how can we really um, make take advantage of all the different potential uses of hydrogen? So we have a port industrial infrastructure that's looking at using hydrogen. We have transport, train and bus transport. We have residence heating, and we also have um, fuel stations basically for, for um, car transport. So all the different uh, uses that we can think of are basically tested and, and piloted by the city of Aberdeen. So we're thinking that the, the Dolphin, um, this, this first demonstration project will be a quite valuable addition actually to, to what, what is done is done there in Aberdeen. So that would be the first bit. And then the next plan would be to then move to commercial scale demonstrator to commercial scale projects. So that is what we call Project Dylan. And this is planned in the Celtic Sea. So this is then off Wales, off the coast of Wales. We are in the process of identifying sites and we're looking into a 300 megawatt development. So we're basically having um, 30 turbines installed and um, then producing hydrogen in a, in a commercial product for the first time. Ideally, the project will be able to move to a gigawatt scale. So ultimately, a couple of years afterwards, um, that, that could be a gigawatt development. And we are looking at the late 20s and the early 30s, basically, for this type um, of development. And the project would have the opportunity to be the largest offshore green hydrogen project in Europe. So if that materializes, then we are We've got a big step actually in really making, uh, moving to generating hydrogen, green hydrogen at scale and, and basically speaking to, to the world. So just summarizing the, the, key, the key takeaways here. So what we are seeing is that the major coastal areas of Europe, the US, Japan and China have excellent wind conditions to develop bulk green hydrogen from both fixed bottom and floating offshore wind. 
we need a supportive regulatory and political framework, but we also need to leverage existing ports and infrastructure. And if we look at what's what's in place there, if we look at the ports in, in mainland Europe, we see lots of developments there for really leveraging tank farms, pipelines, and so on for hydrogen. So this is this will be a key factor in the future. So we need to drive that. Also, if you look at areas like Scotland, which have good oil and gas infrastructure, basically, they are looking intensely at leveraging this infrastructure for hydrogen, which will be a key asset. Um, producing green hydrogen from floating offshore wind will be particularly relevant for um, areas offshore where power transmission costs or losses or curtailment issues will be prohibitive, prohibitive or we simply cannot gain a grid, grid connection but also for areas further ashore where then the, the costs raise um, exponentially. The next topic, the last, the next one, hydrogen carriers. So I think this is one that, that we didn't touch upon today, but something which will um, be covered in one of the next webinars here, I think, hydrogen carriers um, for exporting and importing bulk hydrogen will play an important role in this, in this overall setup. And then ultimately also the development of hydrogen valleys and hydrogen clusters um, offers potential to optimize the, um, the business models. And this is something that we see quite a lot, actually. I mean, I've, I've mentioned Aberdeen, I've mentioned Wales, but also things like the Hamburg Hydrogen Hub, part of Rotterdam, all of these developments, they will be crucial. And um, ultimately, we can only be successful if, if all of these activities are progressed in parallel and basically we really work together to, to optimize the, the potential that we have there. And with that, um, I'm closing my presentation. Thank you very much. We've got it off on the website. So for those who are interested in really more technical information, visit our website, but also happy to answer any questions after the, um, after the next presentation, I think. Yeah, Nedes, thank you very, very much for this very interesting presentation about the ongoing activities, about the development of an on offshore <clears throat> hydrogen production. Um, <clears throat> I do understand that the developments are quite far reaching and there is quite also a lot of technological challenges, which is interesting for me as an engineer. Huh? So, <laughs> so maybe we can have a, let's say, a chat or a little bit of discussion afterwards. Um, because, as you said, we will first have the second presentation from Jens Kotzieber. And now I hope that I present him in the right way. Um, <clears throat> he is um, from ILF Consulting Engineers. Hopefully this is now not completely wrong. Huh? <laughs> Hopefully he looks a little bit more, more happy now yeah, that it's not completely wrong. And he will give us an update about the role of PV power for hydrogen production. Before I give you the floor, I would like to thank again Annette Nienhaus for this very interesting presentation. And as I said, from the questions popping up in the chat, as well as the other questions, which are um, also on the French channel um, coming up. We will have then after the presentation from Jens, a uh, joint discussion, and then we can tackle the one or the other aspect more in detail. For the time being, please <clears throat> apologize that we do not go directly in discussion, and I will pass the word to Jens. We are interesting in your presentation and we are listening to what you have to tell us about PV power for hydrogen production. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kaltschmidt. Thank you very much, Annette, for the previous uh, discussion. Uh, good evening to everybody. Bonsoir à tout le monde. I'm very happy to, to talk to you today from Munich in Germany and uh, about the, the role of uh, PV power for hydrogen production and it's interesting to see uh, the developments in the in the wind sector and as well we see it in the PV sector and at the end we probably need renewable energy for uh, increasing the load factor uh, of the electrolysis and hydrogen production and this is a little bit the topic that I would like to address to you. Actually, uh, my position is set of energy solutions just because of the reason we see more and more renewable energy hubs um, raising in different parts of the world um, with uh, more and more and an increasing portion of renewable energies being produced. And then the issue of how to store and how to transport this energy to the consumption areas. And this is where hydrogen comes into the game. And uh, I present you a little bit about the current situation. 
So some words about uh, the company ILF Consulting Engineers is an engineering consultancy, a little bit uh, similar to ERM, just in another field. So we do mainly engineering, but also consulting and project management services on large uh, infrastructure projects regarding the production, the transport, and also the uh, storage and uh, consumption of energy in different manners. Uh, we originally come from the, um, let's say, oil and gas sector, and we have a lot of process engineers, which is also enabling us to, to enter the hydrogen market quite well. And then the other, other side, seeing a very high pace on the development of renewable energies in different manners, uh, hydropower, but also PV and wind in different uh, manners in different parts in the world, and uh, give consultancy services and engineering services in order to uh, realize these projects. The world of hydrogen becomes more and more complex. Uh, if we look to renewable energies a couple of decades ago, when it started and headed off, uh, we were very much talking about feeding of electricity from renewable energies into the power grid or supplying um, this energy to consumption areas, um, and this has become more and more complex, um, seeing different types of renewable energies um, raising in different parts of the world. Um, and then uh, if we come to the to the green hydrogen as a storage and also transportation mean, uh, we have to think about uh, underground storages, which will also be a topic in the next weeks in this webinar, uh, and then transportation of the hydrogen, uh, which is in a first form, in a gaseous form. So will it be transported by pipeline or will it be transported in different means like ships uh, looking to liquefaction of hydrogen? Uh, looking to uh, conversion into different other chemicals. And uh, the most recent discussion is on ammonia, which is a combination between hydrogen and nitrogen, or even methanol, um, using a carbon source in order to make uh, uh, different types of fuels, uh, different types of feedstock to different industries. So it's not only about talking about mobility, which what we have been done in the last, I would say, five or 10 years. It's also about the chemical industry, the refinery industry, which is still present and will be present for the next decades to come and will need hydrogen and also new areas like the steel industry and other industries which have a need or will have a need for different types of uh, electricity on the one side, but in particular also hard hydrocarbons on the other side, and then hydrogen will uh, most probably be a very, very important source for these products. Uh, this is also where we, we come into the game. We have been uh, working on uh, up to 90 projects right now in the last five years, so there's a very big momentum, and there's also an increase in the size of electrolysis, of hydrogen production uh, five years ago, uh, we thought a four or five megawatt electrolysis plant would be a large project, and this is uh, not anymore the truth. Uh, now we talk about 100 megawatts, we talk about gigawatt scale, even double digit dig um, gigawatt scale projects. And we see a big need for this ramp up of electrolysis capacity, which also needs a ramp up of renewable energy production, and which also needs a big, big ramp up in the manufacturing capacities, which also requires, as we have seen in the oil and gas sector in the last decade, so even 100 years, an increase of the fleet of ships in the increase in ports and so on and so forth, a big increase in the infrastructure which is needed. Um, if we come to a scale larger than about, let's say, 30, even 50 megawatts, we talk about early phase project development, which means um, uh, that uh, we have a lot of feasibility studies and there's a lot of requirements. Annette mentioned the one or the other requirement like regulatory or policy framework, but also financial requirements, offtake requirements. Uh, this is the current situation, why maybe the one or the other project in a large gigawatt scale is developing a little bit slower than expected, 
because there must be one producer investing into electrolysis and uh, let's say make commitments for electrolyzer um, supplies and on the other side commitments from the offtake uh, from the different industries that I mentioned. And these have to come together in order to realize this ramp up of hydrogen production and use. And I just um, have picked out uh, a couple of projects where we have been involved, which are uh, related to solar power. Uh, first of all, uh, where we come from when we have been starting with solar power about 15 or 20 years um, ago, then a thousand megawatts or one gigawatt uh, size of uh, solar power plant was uh, still in a, in a childhood. Uh, and uh, we saw that these um, projects are or have been realized and they're going to be realized. So we really talk in the photovoltaic sector about gigawatt scale production uh, or installation of um, of um, uh, plans and projects in different parts of the world. I just pick out here one project, which is the Mohammed bin Rashid solar park in, uh, in Dubai. And uh, at that time, when it, the project was started, there was also discussion about roadmap, about master plan, what type of solar source might be the most feasible one in order to feed electricity to the market, into the grid and to the consumers. And uh, it's not just about electricity, but also about heat. Um, and uh, this is also a matter uh, which is developing in a higher pace. Uh, so far, we talk very much about electricity, but also heat becomes more and more important. We need a heat transition after an energy or electricity transition and also transition in different industries in order to decarbonize the industries and then also CSPs on the race, but also other means, means of producing heat. And this is where also um, hydrogen comes into the game. Um, we started as um, in, in our company as the consulting company uh, with a project in Austria, um, which is uh, based on an alkaline electrolysis technology. It's a four megawatt electrolysis this um, using um, power from the grid, uh, balance power in particular, um, and uh, transforming uh, or converting it into um, hydrogen in order to uh, feed uh, dual fuel burners, um, tail chain uh, company. And um, this was a demonstration plan actually, and this plan has been commissioned last year. It took uh, some time in order to overcome some obstacles um, that uh, many electrolysis plants in this size four or even 10 megawatt size up to 30 megawatts still face. We are very lucky that this project has now been overcome by other projects in different parts in the world, um, seeing more and more, um, let's say, um, trust and also reliability and maintainability of this technology, uh, which gives a good um, good impression that these projects have can base uh, ramp up uh, into larger scale of projects. Um, what can be said is that uh, alkaline electrolysis uh, technology is a uh, it's a very well known technology for many decades already and it is also applicable to the renewable energy sector uh, the renewable energy sector offering uh, a volatility or volatile source of energy and um, um, the other uh, technology which is comprehending the alkaline electrolysis which is the proton exchange membrane the PAM electrolysis um, has been um, developed in order to even better uh, meet uh, the volatility in power supply and I come to this issue a little bit in later in my presentation. So coming to the to to the uh, photovoltaic um, potential worldwide, and this map is well known and is publicly available, uh, which is already showing um, the potential for uh, the production of solar powers, not only the irradiation. And I mentioned this because um, later on, when we come to other issues like um, production of hydrogen, this map will change again a little bit because 
the quality of the solar irradiation has also um, an impact on the electrolysis on the process plant, actually on the operation of this process plant in order to get as much as our much as possible out of the of the of the power source. So we see, see in some regions in the world, um, a very good conditions uh, for the production of solar power, and um, and we have been involved in in some of the projects. Uh, this map is not representative for all the projects that you may find worldwide. The hundreds um, of hydrogen projects in different scale, but um, it shows uh, quite a lot the 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 hot spots. Let's say. And uh, if we, and to be honest, I come from Europe, so I'm, I'm um, based in Europe. Uh, Europe, um, at least the central or the northern part of Europe is probably not the best place in order to produce uh, solar power based hydrogen. Um, so that this solar power based hydrogen might be transported over long distances in the future. It may also be distributed be, um, um, in between different supply and also demand areas. You can see here some areas um, as we have been uh, talking and we have uh, the Tunisian uh, colleagues uh, involved in this call and probably also other colleagues from parts which are shown here. Uh, this is a very interesting area to look to North Africa in the one aspect. Uh, we also see developments in the Middle East in different countries like Saudi Arabia or Oman. But we also see a little bit farther away developments in South America, like Chile, being on a very high pace um, for developing hydrogen projects and also talking about export projects. Um, we have seen in the last years the top or let's say the largest hydrogen uh, production projects being developed in Australia. Um, and also uh, quite recently, at least from a German perspective, I must admit, is also the South African um, source of energy like Namibia. And um, so this gives a quite interesting variety and also diversity in the supplies from PV source. So here I pick a little bit uh, some of the large scale PV pro and hydrogen production projects that we have been involved in. So one of them is the Helios Green Ammonia Production Plan being developed in Saudi Arabia uh, in the last year, one of the largest uh, electrolysis projects in the, uh, based on PV and uh, mainly, let's say, and uh, the particularity is here in order to make the hydrogen uh, being available to other areas. Um, also including the ammonia production and also the export with export facilities to other areas. Um, a little bit uncommon might be uh, looking to areas in Central Asia, uh, like Kazakhstan, where we have been involved in the Hyrasia One project, which is mainly uh, onshore. We have been hearing today about offshore, but also onshore wind has a big potential for the production of uh, hydrogen. So it's a combination of more than 40 gigawatts of wind and solar PV farm being developed um, with uh, more than 20 gigawatts of water electrolysis uh, and also ammonia production in large scale. And since Kazakhstan is an arid country, uh, like more and more countries uh, developing PV-based hydrogen projects, it's an arid country and also then water is an important uh, uh, issue to think about. Maybe in the dolphin project, um, Annette, we can discuss it later, but I think maybe water in the Northern hemisphere in the UK uh, or alike uh, might be a smaller issue, but it's also an issue. Uh, you mentioned this in your presentation. Other projects uh, we have been involved in is a project I mentioned Australia, uh, which has been for uh, a long period of time an export country per se for uh, resources and uh, for um, uh, different types of mining products uh, may also become an exporter of uh, renewable energies from both wind and power, uh, solar power. And um, so many of the projects being developed there for export issues are gigawatt scale projects. And uh, 
Uh, here I come a little bit to an issue where uh, power transmission is needed. Uh, of course, if you have larger scale projects, then there's also a matter to um, distribute uh, the power production in different fields. And last but not least, Algeria uh, is developing up to 15 gigawatts of solar PV power in the, in the south of Algeria, which is also a need to transport this electricity to the north. Um, at that time, as we have been working on this, uh, we talked about power transmission, but also the large, um, or the, let's say the long distance transport of hydrogen made by pipeline may be an alternative. I come a little bit closer to a project we have been working on in Romania, uh, which is actually uh, the development of an 80 megawatt solar PV plant um, and uh, connected to 10 megawatt uh, electrolysis and hydrogen production facilities. You see here already the, um, let's say the um, uh, the difference in in the size of the of the of the two types of of assets. So we have eight times more of solar PV, um, which is feeding into into the electrolysis plant. And um, the reason for that is uh, the actual the load factor that I mentioned a bit earlier. So the amount of full time hours that the that the plant can run, and as everyone is knows, we cannot run neither solar nor wind power 8,700 hours a year. So we have to deal with this limitation in the supply of electricity. Um, here, the task and challenge. Um, in that project, the task was uh, a maximization of uh, the hydrogen production. So all the electricity which was produced in this solar PV plant had to be used in order to produce hydrogen um, in order to supply uh, local um, uh, offtakers of this hydrogen. And only the surplus of the electricity, which could not be used for the hydrogen production, should be um, injected into the grid. And um, I also want to mention that in the majority of the projects, uh, the power grid is very important um, in order um, to give a kind of uh, backup uh, for the electrolysis. But we have seen from Anata that also other uh, issues may be important and maybe we can also discuss this uh, later a little bit more um, to what extent uh, the power grid is needed. So what were the challenges? The flexibility of the stacks. So the more you um, uh, challenge the stack in the ramp up and also the uh, shutdown of the stacks, uh, the, then the stacks are a little bit, uh, yeah, they are subject to degradation. So this is an optimization issue uh, depending on the project configura on configuration. Then um, the electrolysis usually likes base load. Um, for both technologies, uh, for the alkaline, but also for the proton exchange membrane technology, uh, the more stable the energy supply is, uh, the better it is for the electrolysis, which is also a need for storage, storing the electrical energy before it will be used for the um, hydrogen production. Then the utilization of the electrolyzer is a matter. If you look to the levelized costs of, of hydrogen, um, which means the cost of production um, that Annette also showed in, in her presentation, uh, the higher you can utilize the electrolyzer, the better it is for the cost uh, issue. Um, usually we look to different technology selection. It's not a neither nor, it's, an, it's a, often a combination of different technologies um, which makes uh, the facility more viable. Um, I show here on the right side two different types of uh, PV production. Uh, the one is a fixed tilted mounting structure and the other is a single, ex a single axis tracker. Uh, which follows the, the, the movement of the sun. And uh, here we have picked out different days in the year 1990, uh, which is uh, just a reference year in order to show how it can develop during the year and also the peak is, um, is developing. So usually the electrolysis likes more a flat a curve. Um, and I show you in a, in a next uh, slide uh, where, how we come to that. 
the flat profile allows to switch on different types of stack. As you might be aware of, uh, if we look uh, to 10 megawatts, maybe we can receive uh, quite soon 10 megawatt stacks, but usually the stacks are uh, quite smaller than that. So it's usually a full electrolysis blend. It consists of different types of stacks. And here we um, looked in this project to uh, a setup of up to eight stacks. And then you switch on the stacks one, once the, um, the capacity from the PV power plant is available. Uh, which means uh, we have um, to deal with a little bit of, uh, it's not a loss of electricity, but an unused electricity, which also allows on the other side uh, proper operation of uh, the electrolysis facility and an easier operation of this facility. Um, for the times when the stacks are not used, um, usually one has to think about hot standby, which is which means on the one side pressurized and the alkaline technology at least pressurized um, and also a circulation of the liquid which which needs electricity per se and uh, uh, when there's uh, when there's no sun uh, then there's no electricity so there also need to be some solution in order to keep this hot standby so these are some challenges i mentioned already some issues uh, with respect to the grid connection um, the the pros are definitely um, usually uh, the majority of the projects which are developed and also are in operation as of today are connected to the grid. Um, the the tendency, of course, is to use renewable energy, but uh, using electricity from the grid to in a in a let's say now in a scale of ten or twenty megawatts allows higher load factors and allows to run the electrolysis facility in a higher utilization. Um, it's also good to use the, the grid in order to develop demonstration or pilot plans to develop or test new technologies to make uh, electrolysis cheaper or more reliable or something like this. So the power grid is a good backup. Uh, the, the power grid is also interesting in order to have a balance once the electrical energy cannot be used for the electrolysis, then this electricity can be fed in, into the grid. Grid balancing service is an interesting option also allowing the one or the other operator of an electrolysis facility to, to find a good way between the, the purchase of power and also uh, the sales of hydrogen in order to, to create business case. Increasing the load factor, I mentioned this already also backup of power. On the other side, we see in these renewable energy hubs being developed in different parts in the world that they have um, not a connection to the power grid, or we see also projects in remote areas where no power grid is available. And then we have to deal with um, the challenge that only the power which is available from the renewable energy source can be used for the electrolysis. So it's a little, little bit of an uh, excursion into the other side. I mentioned the four megawatt. I mentioned now the the ten uh, megawatt electrolysis and um, the challenges that we faced with a project that we developed in Kazakhstan with the twenty gigawatts means we have thousands of stacks um, which are smaller um, than ten megawatt each. Uh, we have to think about a modular setup. So now um, we see in different parts, uh, in different projects, in different parts in the world, uh, in the discussion about 100 megawatt uh, facilities and, uh, and up coming to 20 gigawatts means adding one uh, module uh, by module, which was also mentioned in Annette's uh, presentation before with developing the Dolphin project. Then the ammonia production makes the whole story much more difficult from a process point of view because ammonia production needs a certain and also stable um, uh, heat um, in order to, to, to have a hot standby and uh, which uh, need, which make uh, which increases the need to have a stable and also a um, quite uh, flat uh, supply of hydrogen to this facility. 
In that case, we did not have a grid connection and we did not have a backup of power. Um, here, the maximization was a little bit different from the project that I presented in Romania here. The maximization was really the use of power um, in order to feed into the uh, electrolysis plan and, and also the, the, the stacks, which also meant a flexibility of stack operation. So you would operate the stacks in a range between 10 and 100 percent and uh, this also requires a complex control system which controls the flows controls the temperature controls the pressure um, of the entire process facility and storage is an issue always in between the different uh, process step it can be electricity storage can be hydrogen storage or ammonia storage which is which is another challenge and last but not least, I mentioned this before, that water is an issue and also the source and the quality of water is an issue to the electrolysis, uh, which may become another topic in this webinar. So concluding a little bit my presentation, I picked out four um, points. Um, of course, meet the challenge and uh, realize projects. And I'm very lucky to see that projects in a scale up to 100 megawatts or even beyond are realized. So they are in a feed stage, an FID stage already. And um, so I'm very glad that some investors take this opportunity to develop these projects and to ramp up the, the market. So identify appropriate locations for the PV-based electrolysis plan is an issue. Find the right source of PV. Um, optimize the PV plan with the electrolysis, so sizing and um, and also dimensioning. Um, I would like to mention also the distance to customers. Always think about transportation issues um, and also the volumes. It's, it makes a big difference to transport 1,000 tons compared to 1 million tons of hydrogen. And last but not least, compensate um, the dark hours uh, for PV power plants with other renewable energy sources. So it's not only PV or it's not only wind or other type of single energy, renewable energy. We will see a variety of renewable energy sources to feed one electrolysis plant. And for that, I thank you very much um, uh, to be here today and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Martin, it's yours. Yeah, Jens, thanks a lot for this very interesting, what is very inspiring and for this very, <clears throat> let's say, far-reaching presentation. Thanks a lot for that. And <clears throat> thank you again also for Annette for her presentation. I think both of them fits very nicely together. And um, <clears throat> let's, we have still have a couple of minutes. Let's maybe start a little bit of uh, discussion um, about both of them. And if I look on the French stream, then let's say one question was popping up, which um, I, if I understand it right, is my bet. Let's say French. Then the question is, what about the costs? Are you competitive? Are these commercial projects what you're talking about? And when do you think that you might become competitive to the fossil world um, based on these different projects? Do you still see that, let's say, we can come down with the costs on the on the renewable side? How do you expect that this will develop and how do you see this um, from your point of view? So maybe we have ladies first, if this is fine with you, Annette, and then we move over to the lovely village of Munich. Huh? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, this this is what we're all talking about or what it's all about, right? I mean, we want to generate um, basically green hydrogen at an economic cost. And um, I think the message clearly is here um, in this initial phase, there, there's still, I mean, there's a policy framework required, but also there's an investment framework required, um, which will involve some, um, let's say, public concepts, public funding, um, also some appetite from investors really to invest in this new technology. Ultimately, when we look at the large scale developments and the 300 megawatt development that I mentioned, we are looking to be cost effective at, at that point in time and, and, and really say we can generate green hydrogen at a, at a competitive cost. Um, obviously, we don't know where energy prices are going. I mean, if what, what we're seeing right now is really a roller coaster. But um, if we look at the long term, uh, basically um, prices and and if we look at what's going to happen, what we expect to happen with basically scaling up and, and economies of scale, 
ultimately we we are confident that we will be able to to produce that but all of the all of the topics that I, I think that have been discussed extensively you know the chicken and egg problem who's going to start somebody has needs to have the appetite to start but also the frameworks need to be need to be set i mean this remains these challenges remain and and we need to address that Okay, thank you. Again. Maybe I can add it. Thank you very much uh, for this for this question. I think, um, as Anetta mentioned before, it's a, it's a matter of economies of scale, and we expect with the large scale projects uh, to get uh, elect, uh, the, the cost of uh, production down uh, with respect to the electrolyzer cost. Um, we have seen in the last um, years um, that the decrease of the electrolysis is still in a in a in a in a range uh, um, that is not comparable to the PV uh, decrease of cost. Um, actually, the levelized cost of electricity has um, has gone much um, um, down, and uh, they have declined very much, which is. It is a very positive effect uh, to develop large scale projects. Um, on the other side, uh, that also uh, smaller projects can uh, be viable in a very local um, uh, atmosphere uh, with uh, quite a competitive uh, cost of hydrogen. Um, so saying this, it's also the uh, the alternative, um, which means uh, the hydrogen being produced from fossil sources uh, is still cheaper, but but there's also a change uh, if we look to CO2 prices uh, on, on this production. Um, and um, I think uh, that um, the, the development now is, um, as Annette said, uh, co-financing is a big issue. So the majority of the projects that we are working on are co-financed. Uh, there are some means in order to develop um, offtake agreements uh, to bring producers and consumers together in order to also establish a market for hydrogen, which is not really present yet. So the transportation of hydrogen between production and consumption areas have to be developed. And uh, um, yes, uh, the, the hydrogen from electrolysis is still more expensive, but becomes more competitive, and we see good signs in order to, to come to that point. Okay, thank you very much for that. Yeah, I mean, as always, the question is the euros, uh, which are coming out. So from that point of view, thank you very much for that. And um, we also expect from my point of view, my personal point of view, that let's say energy don't get cheaper in the years to come. It will become more expensive. And if we also have additional CO2 um, penalty or CO2 tax, I mean, this will add up to this. And from that point of view, I think in the future, the renewables will get more competitive. But nevertheless, this is my personal view and um, <clears throat> it's tonight not a question of my personal view. Um, maybe we have um, we, we move a little bit more to technology. Um, one topic which is popping up here is the question that let's say you, Annette, with your concept, you have an electrolyzer per windmill. And on the other hand side, we learned from Jens that he said, hey, well, the more systems I have, if I combine wind and solar, for example, and I even have more options to provide energy from renewables, the better my system gets, the more reliable it gets, and the more, um, <clears throat> let's say, constant flow of hydrogen can be produced. So this is a little bit of contradiction. How do you see this? Why you don't, why you go for one electrolyzer per windmill and not maybe for one electrolyzer per five windmills or 10 or maybe a wind park? which is also an option which at least is technically feasible. Yeah, Correct me if I'm wrong. And maybe we can discuss this topic a little bit more in detail. What are the reasons why you come up with the dolphin concept? And on the other hand side, um, <clears throat> where um, maybe Jens, you can say a couple of, of, of statements, how you see the, 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 the system size what is the good combination between a kind of electrolyzer size and a kind of of of, of um, <clears throat> system size? If we talk about standalone systems, for example, what is um, I guess the um, goal for uh, Anetis concept? Maybe you can um, come up with a couple of ideas about that, Anetis. Ladies first, if this is fine, and then let's move to Jens. 
Yeah. Okay. I think. I mean, ultimately, it's it's about everything, right? I mean, there's not. It's not that we are saying this. This technology is the one that's going to to be um, only. Um, or the best thing, the only thing in the future. I think what we will see is basically we'll have um, different types of technologies. We also have different combinations of technologies, which need to be adapted to the local local requirements. And um, I mean, the the question for photovoltaics, I think, is um, if you if you look at wind. One of the benefits of going offshore is if you go further offshore, the wind gets stronger. So you have that direct link. You may have more costs. Things become more costly if you basically have to install um, longer, let's say, connections. Or if you have to go further for, um, ashore for OPEX, for, for, for maintenance, and basically have to, to bring personnel um, further ashore. But you also have these better wind resources. So that makes it very clear why we want to go offshore with, with our wind um, installations. The um, case for solar is a bit different. I mean, if you go further ashore, you don't have an increase in, 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 in solar radiation necessarily, without me being an expert in that, but I think that's that's um, what I understand. So there's no direct connection, um, but you have the higher costs if you, if you go further afield, which means that um, basically, I think there will in the future be projects which will combine wind, offshore wind and and um, have some kind of floating PV. But I don't see that modular approach working with that. So I, I would be hard pressed to come up with a modular approach of combining PV and, and wind, which is why this is not part of the Dolphin project. But then again, having said that, I mean, I'm sure that we'll see combined projects in the in the future, where we may have probably closer to shore large scale floating PV installations coupled coupled with wind turbines. Okay, yes, yeah, don't know what yeah, your point is there. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think that question is very good because um, I do not really see contradiction in between what Annette says and what I said. Um, I think it's uh, it's the, the fact is and coming to the question before the cost of electrolysis is pretty high. So and and then the cost of uh, renewable energy sources is decreasing or has this has decreased pretty much so if you compare this one project where we have 80 megawatts of solar and only 10 megawatts of electrolysis, of electrolysis shows reduction of the capacity of the electrolysis which means on the other side you increase the the load factor or the utilization of the electrolysis so this is the current situation that we want to use the electrolysis as much as possible what you can see you, you can do this with with one source it, it depends very much on the on the on the potential um of of the of the source how how, how much electricity it is providing and only the combination of different types of uh, renewable energies uh, allows to increase the load factor in in some areas where it's also feasible. If you look to the northern sea, I think the the wind, the offshore wind potential, is is very good. And um, I don't know how many load factor, how many um, full load hours you were talking about. This might be sufficient for the electrolysis. In other parts where you have maybe maybe only a thousand full load hours uh, per year. And then you have to think if you combine wind and solar, maybe other sources, you increase these amount of hours. So it's not a contradiction. And but the but the tendency now is to decrease the total cost of the entire system as good as possible. And total system means everything, uh, including renewable energy and electrolysis and conversion into different mains and and also increase uh, the utilization of the facility of the electrolysis facility. Oh, I mean, of course, the costs are the driver, and um, this is also one one question which has been coming up: that is the combination, for example, with PV and CSP. Is this a solution to improve the reliability and reduce the costs? How do you see this? What is the role of CSP in a future, let's say, provision of hydrogen based on solar? Well, um, that's a good question because um, uh, we have seen that uh, the cost of PV have decreased much uh, faster than CSP, but also CSP now catching up to a certain extent. 
uh, providing not only electricity but also heat. And uh, the major input in the, into the electrolysis is the electricity. So we see now in the projects that we are developing, uh, not yet we do not yet see CSP as a as a source of energy for electrolysis, but uh, CSP is providing thermal power, and uh, also uh, the hydrogen. Uh, may be used at least in the process industry and also to in order to provide uh, high temperature um, heating uh, or thermal power and uh, so we can we will most probably see in the next years to come uh, let's say a combination or at least uh, maybe even a competition between uh, CSP as a source a direct source from solar power compared to using hydrogen as a as a as a fuel, um, a burning fuel, in order to provide this heat, um, I think uh, that discussion will pop up in the next years to come. Uh, once there is also a cost parity between the two technologies. Well, I mean the cost parity between PV and <clears throat> CSP has been, let's say, ten years ago. It's the other way around. Yeah? PV had much been much more expensive compared to CSP. And now it's the other way around. And um, let's say at least from the analysis, what we did here at the Institute, we had, um, let's say, I have my doubts that let's say CSP will come to um, the order of magnitude where PV is today, because simple from the material, what you need, from the technology, what you need, from the, let's say, high temperature processes, what you do have, from the moving parts, what you have, it's always more demanding. Yeah. So there might be only good for good reasons that you do this effort. But maybe, again, this is my personal opinion and this might change. I also was very astonished that we have seen such a price drop in PV, which at least I personally would not have been expected, honestly, <laughs> 10 years ago. Yeah. So um, let's, let's come close to the end. But before that, I just would like to pick up another point, um, which... Let's say we have seen from what you Jens has presented is that let's say large units um, spring up a little bit more, let's say reliability in systems. And um, from you, what you said on that is basically you have one windmill. I just make it in a nutshell. Yeah, one windmill, windmill with, with one electrolyzer. So there might be safety issues. There might be other problems. And therefore the question is, is it not may be more, let's say, promising from a system's point of view, if you transport, even when the costs are higher, the electricity to the coast, where you have a large scale electrolyzer, and maybe also can use the electricity directly if there is the demand for that, Yeah, that at the end of the day, this is a more reliable and more re a, a silent system. How do you see this? Well, in principle, I think if we are close to the shore, then I mean we've got we've got proven concepts, and um, basically we know that um, I mean we have offshore wind farms, fixed bottom wind farms, which um, transport electricity to the shore. We know the costs of that. So as long as we have the let's say enough space and um, the the infrastructure to connect the installations to shore, then probably the electrolyzers onshore has an advantage. I think what's um, what what the considerations for Dolphin have, have been is what if we move further ashore? So for the reasons we discussed, I mean, at one point in time, we'll have exploited the nearshore potential. We need to move further, further offshore. And then we get a problem with this exponentially rising cost for, for electrical connections. This will be the point where, where Dolphin comes in. Also, if we have increasing um, problems with the electricity connections, and we see that already, I think, in the in the German North Sea, where we have this problem of um, that that um, the the connections, the electricity cabling, the um, high voltage DC cables, and so on, really become the bottleneck. And I think, in that sense, then the direct electrolysis will become interesting. And I think we'll see more and more of that for exactly that reason. Um, but close to shore, we will continue to see the, the transport of electricity to shore and the, the onshore electrolyzers. Because, again, I mean, it's proven concepts. We can operate electrolyzers onshore. Offshore, we need to do lots of validation. And um, we, we, we don't know what what um, what comes out of that. We also discussed the, the power balancing, all of these aspects, the, the variable input. So 
this needs looking into it, but I think it's, and, and we think it's worth it because that will enable us to go further, sure, basically. Okay, thank you very much for that. So then let's come to an end. And before I, let's say, finalize or terminate this session for tonight, I maybe I first give you on it and then you, Jens, the word to say where you would like to see the offshore hydrogen production in 10 years time. And you, Jens, how you see the PV hydrogen production in a 10 years time. What role you have, what um, role you can play, where you see the main markets and the main production areas. Maybe we start again, if this is fine with you, Annette, with you, and then we move over to Jens. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, definitely exciting prospect. So if, if I look 10 years ahead, um, in, the, in the ideal world, we really have put our words into practice. I think that's the, that's the key thing that I'm looking forward to. I mean, we, we've talked about the concepts that we want to have the, the first really large scale commercial projects running. So around 2030. So I, I would want to see um, maybe not single gigawatt projects, but quite quite a bit of, of, of multi-megawatt projects installed offshore, which are actually operating and with, which are able to produce, produce hydrogen. So I'm I'm seeing in my mind the, the vision I'm having is that we are at a stage where we can produce hydrogen at, at cost, at scale, so in an economic way where it is competitive and where we have projects really up and running, um, which show that this is the case. Um, in Europe, but ideally also in other locations around the world. Okay, thank you, Jens. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, that uh, the, the the source of sun, the sun which is providing energy to our world is, is, is an excellent source. And it's providing this electricity source of electricity or the source of energy uh, to many places, uh, even not all areas in the world. There's, uh, uh, there will be competition uh, and I think there will be also diversity in the energy supplies, uh, which can be seen in different parts of the world. Uh, we I also see in the next, next 10 years to come, um, I think um, the solar power will remain the cheapest source of energy and uh, will also provide very good base in order to, to transport and also to make this electricity um, available to different uh, parts in the world, which requires, we see transportation issues. And we also need, see, we will see in the next 10 years, um, see issues of uh, the security of supply. So the diversity of the different sources, I showed this on the, on the one map, is also providing um, more reliability and also more secure source of supplies. And I see really a significant increase in using PV, uh, but also besides wind, of course, but PV as in a significant source uh, in different countries. Okay, then thank you very much for these final statements. So that I interpret that you both see the future in this respect that a lot of developments will ongoing. And most likely we will see that more of the projects materialize in the years to come. With this, um, let's finalize or terminate our tonight's session. First of all, I would like to thank Annette Nienhaus and then Jens <clears throat> Kotzieber for this very excellent presentations, for this insight into the offshore <clears throat> activities and the PV activities related to hydrogen production. And thank you very much for taking your time and thank you very much for your nice presentations. Um, <clears throat> additionally, I would like to thank the organizer um, <clears throat> for giving us the opportunity to realize this um, webinar and especially the people which are working behind <clears throat> the curtain, so to say, to make everything technologically wise workable. This is Wolfram Tuszewiski and Fabian Karel. Thank you very much for that. And <clears throat> also, of course, our colleagues from Tunisia, especially Shoki Aslush and the colleague from GIZ. And last but not least, of course, the translator, which have the, let's say, duty to try to translate everything as good as possible into the French language. So thank you very much for that and taking the burden to try to translate this bad German English, at least my bad German English, into um, <clears throat> a nice um, French. 
And last but not least, I would like to announce that next week, same place, same time, we will have um, the question about hydrogen in Tunisia. We will have first a presentation about STHG strategy on the development of PDX in Tunisia from <clears throat> Chaleb Enin from STHG in Tunisia. And then we have another presentation about green hydrogen opportunities and challenges for Tunisia from Sheep, <clears throat> uh, Sheep Buden from Enid in, also in Tunisia. Then on the 1st of February, we will tackle the question of hydrogen underground storage. And then we will go further in detail about the developments in hydrogen storage on the 8th of February. And then we will further go down the overall road on the overall provision chain. With this, thank you very much again, especially to our guest speakers, um, Anne de Nienhaus and Jens Kotzbeger. Uh, Sipa, sorry for, um, let's say, um, saying the name not in the right way. And I wish everybody a beautiful evening. Enjoy yourself. And I would very, very happy to welcome you again in one week, same place, same time. Good night and bye-bye. <laughs>